Welcome, dear friends, to Bread and Roses. I hope you're all doing well. I'm Mariam Namazi. And I'm Fadi Borspuya. In this week's program, we're going to be speaking about the highest literary prize that was given to an Iranian a refugee, Behruz Bouchani, who has been on Manus Island uh, for six years now. He talks about the most inhuman conditions. He also has such a human response, such a dignified response. And also, through that, we will look at the horrendous situation of refugees and asylum seekers worldwide. Ac across the board. And this is the moment to take stock of the situation. Mm -hmm. uh, this week, our uh, interview is with Omar Makram, the founder of the uh, Castle of Ex Muslim of Sweden. Stay with us, don't go away. Behruz Bouchani, an Iranian refugee on Manus Island, has won the highest literary award in Australia and he's been on Manus Island for six years. And he really, you know, his, his, his book uh, that he wrote on WhatsApp, his words uh, accepting uh, the, uh, the prize really uh, shows so much humanity vis-a-vis -vis the sort of brutality and barbarity that's been imposed on refugees by the Australian government. And you could see uh, there is a contrast here. And this contrast shows at the same time the dominant policy of all governments now all governments, irrespective, doesn't matter European, North American, Australia, everybody, is to create hell for asylum seekers and refugees. These are the best of uh, most of the societies who run away and they are resistant and the centers of those countries and they want to live better, that always have positive contribution. And, and the uh, policy of the uh, governments now is completely inhumane and you can see the situation they've created. Now they are creating concentration caps. Mm -hmm. This is the first one. Europe is planning to create concentration caps. Look at them, what's happening in America and, and the way Trump is treating the uh, refugees and asylum seekers coming over from southern borders and everywhere else. Um, and you stand, you know, Amaze the, the level of brutality of this system is imposing on uh, on asylum seekers and refugees and immigrants. By the same time, there is resistance every day against this situation. And of course, we know that it's become so brutal, especially after the end of the Cold War, because uh, at the time, during the Cold War, the West wanted to show that it was so much more pro-human rights than the Soviet Union at the time. And so refugee rights was respected. Lots of people were able to get refugee status. And after that, of course, we've seen the end of the right to uh, refuge and the criminalization of refugees as well. So that, you know, all we hear about is how people are illegal. But listen, people have no choice but to leave without proper documents. That's really what the issue is. They can't get a visa um, uh, from European countries, for example. And also, they can't get an exit visa very often uh, by the governments that are persecuting them. So obviously, they're going to have to leave in ways uh, that are not completely legal uh, without proper documents. But that's the, always been historically the reality of refugees. How do you think Jewish refugees fled uh, Nazi-occupied areas? It was the same way. Uh, you know, very often they were criminalized then too. European governments returned Jewish people to their death. And also people who helped uh, Jewish refugees were criminalized. We're seeing the same thing again right now. Uh, absolutely. And you could, you, you could see, uh, even when the uh, asylum seekers succeed in entering into the, uh, uh, the countries and, and claim asylum, they're treated not only as second citizens, but as non-existent citizens. The way they're treated, look at the whole asylum system in, in Europe, the way asylum seekers are. Uh, accommodated. They are deprived of the right to work. I mean, come on, you've got families uh, who, uh, you know, they can't, they can't live, they can't, they limited access to various services, they are uh, put in a substandard accommodation at the mercy of uh, unscrupulous uh, uh, accommodation providers, and they have to stay in that situation. Imagine families uh, staying for, for five, sometimes. six, seven, eight years in that situation with no end, and that destroys the life. Even those who are uh, um, immigrants and become sort of regularized or the situation is uh, accepted, they're still treated as second-class citizens. And look at the Windrush generation in England. Mm. Even, um, you know, uh, Theresa May suppressing studies that proves 
that there is no negative impact of immigration on, on wages. And shamelessly, she goes to the Tory party conference and says, you know, uh, people who low wages, uh, you know, it's understandable. People don't talk about it, but it's understandable why they feel aggrieved uh, um, um, because of the low wage immigration. I mean, and of course, you know, when you look at the situation of uh, refugees and asylum seekers everywhere, they are really the most vulnerable. Uh, for example, uh, if you look at uh, even just the numbers of people who have died trying to get into Europe, you know, one out of every 18 person has drowned in the Mediterranean Sea. This is a scandal. And then if people go to help them, they're criminalized. If they're trying to flee, they're criminalized. The Stansted 15 is a great case in point, you know, using counter-terrorism measures in order to imprison and criminalize people who are peacefully trying to save the lives of those who are being deported. Absolutely, and you could see under the pressure of public opinion, the courts, they've said, although they've, they've condemned them on the Anti-Terrorism uh, Act, uh, um, you know, under pressure of the public op opinion, they could not put them to, send them to, to prison, and that's important. Because at the same time, while there is all these measures, at the very same time, the resistance against uh, um, these immigration and inhuman conditions are growing every day. You'll mm -hmm. see Bochani in Australia and her uh, Australian society, not the Australian government, Australian society is uh, um, embracing Yeah, there's uh, a Bochani. huge campaign, isn't there, Absolutely. for uh, people, to, for uh, refugees to be brought onto Australian a soil. Absolutely. And uh, on the other hand, you see support for Stanislav 15, mm -hmm. uh, the situation of the Iranian asylum seekers in Turkey. Yeah. This is just an unacceptable situation. But at the same time, campaigns are starting to, uh, to defend them and, and try to put this right. But it's a struggle that is going to continue. Yeah, and even uh, one of the things that the Stanislav 15 said, which I found really interesting, in front of the court, they said that, you know, what's happened to us is nothing compared to what happens every day to asylum seekers and refugees across the world, you know. So uh, they talk about the fact that uh, immigration officials go at midnight and try to grab people in their sleep. Uh, they're detained, they're deported, they're beaten. One of the things Behruz Buchani talks about is the humiliation, you know, to be so humiliated only because you are not properly documented, you know, is really scandalous, it's outrageous, but it happens all the time, it's justified, it's legitimized, and of course, um, we know so many cases, you know, uh, there's the case of Faso Hadrizvi that you work on. Uh, absolutely, and uh, uh, Faso had was uh, he's been uh, um, placed in Sweden, um, and for uh, last week where the temperature dropped below zero, he, he, him and his family, we've got two children of uh, four-year-old and 12-year-old, were left with no heating and, and hot water in that temperature. For days. For, for, days. for days and yeah. days, three or four days. Yeah. And it was only through uh, Twitter and, and, and pressure on the um, on local government, which we did nothing at all. Uh, we, we managed to... Um, a force action after four or five days by the accommodation provider to come and uh, uh, temporarily resolve the issue. But this is a situation of so many asylum-seeking mm -hmm. families mm -hmm. who put in temporary accommodation. The, 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 the right to work has been taken away from them. The life, the normal life has been taken away and, and effectively put in uh, um, a situa uncomfortable situation to deter people uh, uh, claiming the right to, to asylum. Yeah, and of course there are other um, asylum seekers. We've just recently had a campaign called Refugee 2 where we were saying that there are lots of atheists uh, um, and ex-Muslims who also should be considered refugees like uh, Rahaf uh, Muhammad who was recently given refuge in, in Canada. So people like Muhammad Ali, people like uh, Aftab Ahmad and of course uh, Fasad Rizvi. Um, and the fact that, you know, um, they're not believed uh, they're told that, you know, they can live discreetly as atheists in countries where atheists are persecuted. And of course, in a way, when we look at it, the situation is even so much more worse in countries bordering places like Iran, like, you know, Turkey, Iraq, uh, where, you know, Iranian refugees, for example, are in the worst situation. They're not getting support from the UNHCR. And also, um, recently, the UNHCR has just put its hands up and said, we're not processing any more cases. Uh, uh, Go uh, to the Turkish government. Turkish government and get used to the situation of uh, uh, Turkey. Now, Turkey is an Islamist country. We know one hand in hands of the hands are in the uh, um, in Daesh camp and ISIS camp. 
We know very clearly that the, uh, the work with the Iranian uh, um, government against the refugees and asylum seekers, the lives are in danger, and the United Nations is collaborating with, uh, uh, with the government of Turkey and actually advising the asylum seekers to get used to the situation and, and uh, you know, to the situation um, and be compatible with the Turkish society. Where they've got no papers, where yeah. they can't work, where they can't go to school. I mean, what sort and of... So they don't have health care, they don't have any sort of... Uh, Absolutely, and, and so many of the Turkish uh, uh, authorities... Kids people, can't go to school, I'm sorry. Mm, Refugee okay. kids can't go to school. Six, seven years they're in Turkey. And uh, and the uh, Turkish o officials are all Islamists now, you yeah. know. Imagine atheist, uh, uh, ex-Muslim asylum seekers uh, uh, like Arsalan um, going and, and presenting and trying to case make a case against Turkey, you know, uh, in front of the Turkish officials. Imagine the sort of situation they're yeah. facing. And I think the United Nations uh, refugee agency in Turkey should be ashamed of itself. Yeah, and of course these are the, uh, we should actually name some of the refugees that are... Um, uh, that that are in very serious conditions. They're atheists. Uh, Ar Arsalan Nejati, Iman uh, Iman Soleimani Amiri, Amir and Mina Kalate, and also there's a, a woman called Basma who are in Turkey and who needs safety and protection. The best thing to do uh, to end our segment is really to end with uh, Behruz Bouchani's words: words of resistance and humanity in the face of such brutality. Uh, that has been imposed on refugees in Ma Manus Island and other uh, surrounding islands uh, by the Australian government. When I arrived at Christmas Island six years ago, an immigration official called me into the office and told me that they were going to exile me to Manus Island, a place in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. I told them that I am a writer that same person just laughed at me and ordered the guards to exile me to Manus. I kept this image in my mind for years, even while I was writing my novel. And even right now, as I am writing this acceptance speech, it was an act of humiliation when I arrived in Manus, I created another image for myself. I imagine a novelist in a remote prison. Sometimes I would walk half naked beside the prison fences and imagine a novelist locked up right there in that place. This image was all inspiring for years I maintained this image in my mind, even while I was forced to wait in a long queue to get food or while enduring other humiliating moments. This image always helped me uphold my dignity and keep my identity as a human being. In fact, I created this image in opposition to the image created by the system. After years of struggling against a system that has completely ignored our individual identities, I am happy that we have arrived at this moment. This proves that words still have the power to challenge inhuman systems and structures. I have always said that I believe in words and literature. I believe that literature has the potential to make change and challenge the structures of power. Literature has the power to give us freedom. Yes, it is true. I have been in a cage for years, but throughout this time, my mind has always been producing words. And these words have taken me across borders, taking me overseas and to unknown places. I truly believe words are more powerful than the fences of this place, this prison. This is not just a basic slogan. I am not an idealist. I am not expressing the views of an idealist here. 
these words are from a person who has been held captive on this island for almost six years. A person who has witnessed an extraordinary tragedy unfold in this place. These words allow me to appear there with you tonight. With humility, I would like to say that this award is a victory. It is a victory not only for us, but for literature and art. And above all, it is a victory for humanity, a victory for human being, human dignity. A victory against a system that has never recognized us as human being. It is a victory against a system that has reduced us to numbers. This is a beautiful moment. Let us all rejoice tonight in the power of Have you on our program. I wanted to speak to you about the whole idea of asylum and apostasy, especially after Rahaf's case, and you yourself applied for asylum here in Sweden yes. um, as an atheist mm. who had fled Egypt. Mm. Uh, you came across a lot of problems though, and that's something I think um, others do too. Yes. What was the main problem with you not being accepted initially? Yeah. Well, first of all, thank you for having me on, on your show uh, and yes you are uh, it, it is a big problem here with ex-muslims seeking asylum in Sweden uh, because of the let's say the burden of proof I think it's the migration agency exaggerates in, in placing uh, demands on on let's say proving that a person has left Islam I think yeah unreasonable demands. So, for example, in my case, uh, when I came here and applied for asylum and I, and I thought that I would just like tell them everything about my story and what I'm facing and so on, and they will just, no, uh, provide me with asylum. But uh, it's my experience with the migration agency is that they were not really trying to to evaluate the evidence that I gave them to ascertain whether I have a valid uh, valid grounds for asylum, but they were more trying to find excuses to reject my asylum. Um, so, for example, I remember, like uh, when I showed them like stuff from social media and stuff, they said, "Oh, but maybe that's photoshopped." And I was like, "But you can check that online." Um, so, some ridiculous stuff like that. And in the end, they did acknowledge that. Uh, for example, people in Egypt who leave Islam or are critical of Islam are being persecuted, but they refuse to acknowledge that I was one, like I had left Islam. Um, and they had said that it, had I been able to prove that, I would have been entitled to asylum. Uh, and another thing is that they said that I did not provide them with evidence that the Egyptian authorities are aware of my views on Islam. Um, which is something that I cannot really do. I cannot ask the Egyptian embassy for a document saying that, oh yeah, we know that this guy is an atheist, he's a pain in the ass. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and of course this is something we see quite regularly, don't yes. we? Uh, people being refused uh, yes. based on the fact that they're not believed and also yes. uh, asking for evidence that's just really impossible to get. I mean, unless you can bring your dead corpse and say, well, does this yes. prove, is this proof enough that I've I'm going to be persecuted yes, after it's, the fact, you know. Yes, yeah, like catch-22 thing. Yeah. So it's like, maybe you need to be in prison for you to get asylum, but if you're in prison, you can't get asylum. <laughs> but, well, of course, it's, it's, uh, it's reasonable to some extent for people to prove that they have, like, to that their beliefs are genuine and they have, like, they have a, a genuine case at, uh, and to talk about how they, they came to leave Islam and what they think about it and so on. Um, but within reason, um, and, and this is something I would say that 
the migration board does not do for the most part. Although it's also like sometimes also it's, it can be a bit like a lottery because there have been cases of ex-Muslims uh, who have been granted asylum rather, yeah, without too much of a fuss. Um, so, and this is something also the migration agency has, has been criticized for. Uh, that it, it there's like some kind of sort of like non conformity yeah yeah exactly mm -hmm. so uh, what about there's a case uh, you're you're uh, working on of an Iraqi atheist yes who's also facing deportation isn't he yes exactly so Ahmed al Qomar is his name and he's uh, from Iraq as you said and an ex Muslim atheist um, and he has been here in Sweden struggling for us for his asylum for three years now. Uh, and he's actually uh, facing threats even from his father and his uncle and he even provided the migration agency with a copy of like not even the copy the original of uh, of an arrest warrant uh, that is that is uh, yeah against him in Iraq uh, with like a like a, a sentence from the court uh, related to uh, his his atheism um, him being vocal about his atheism, uh, but still he was he was rejected by the migration agency time and again um, because of the same thing. The they are saying that he has not proved to them that he has left Islam. Mm, so even an arrest warrant isn't enough for that. No, they. <laughs> but that's the thing. Like in my experience and and in other cases I've seen, in some of the other cases I've seen at least. It seems to me, like from my point of view, it's like this: you provide migration board, uh, the migration board with a with a case. What they do is they look into it and try to find, okay, here, how will we reject this? What can we say about this and that so that we reject it? This is, it seems to me, their approach. This is their angle in a way. Uh, and I think it's supposed to be the other way around. Um, oh? Yeah, definitely. Mm. And it's interesting because now you finally have asylum after a big fight and a battle like Rahav. I mean, yes. I think if you don't fight for it, it's very likely that you uh, will be uh, fall within the cracks. Yes. And uh, you are now working uh, against honor crimes. Uh, yes, in uh, in, in Stockholm. I, I mean, a, a lot of great work that you're doing because you're now able to. Yes, exactly. And it's like I had to go a little bit to to the ex to an extreme, as you know, like because after they they rejected uh, my case, I was thinking I was going to get deported, and I was thinking, okay, what can I do to prove to the migration board that I'm no longer a Muslim? Um, and then I made a video and talked about my views and talked about my case, talked about the situation of ex-Muslims in Muslim majority countries. Um, about the situation in Egypt, uh, or like with people who criticize Islam and, and so on. Um, and then I, I said that the only thing that no Muslim would ever do is to desecrate the Quran. And this is what I did on video. Uh, so I desecrated a copy of the Quran on video. Uh, and then first I, I showed this to, my, to some of my friends here who were aware of my case. They just freaked out and they said, okay, maybe you'll get the asylum, but we don't know if you will live long enough to enjoy it, even here in Sweden. I was like, yeah, but will this increase my chances? Um, they said, yeah, but maybe send it to migration board first privately um, before going public with it. Then I did that and uh, I sent it to migration board and the same email to the Egyptian embassy, the Egyptian foreign ministry and the Egyptian interior ministry so that they have, okay, Here's your proof that they are aware of it. So, in a, in a sense, they push you to extremes in order to be yeah. able to prove who you are. You know? Yes, it's, that it's is... your personal belief. I yes, think. this is sometimes the case, yes, yes. Uh, often the case, actually, I would say. Uh, um, why, I mean, why do you think it's so important for ex-Muslims to have asylum and protection in a place like Sweden or Europe or anywhere? Um, I think, like... In, in most of like Muslim majority countries, there is a very hostile climate uh, towards ex-Muslims. Uh, 
and people who criticize Islam and atheists, um, both socially and legally. Uh, so most countries are not safe for ex-Muslims to be open with their identity, to be open with their beliefs or lack of beliefs or to exercise their freedom of conscience and freedom of, of uh, thought, uh, freedom of belief. Um, and this is why it's, it's very important uh, for them to be able to get this protection, to be able to be fully free and safe. But what do you say to, uh, you know, the Home Office, for example, has told some of our activists that they could go back and live in Pakistan or Egypt or Iran and just not mention that they're ex-Muslims and just uh, live discreetly, basically? Yes, actually, this, at some point, this was something that was said to me as well. Like, uh, I remember, like, Migration Board said something, uh, like, in the we had, like, a court session and, uh, and they said something um, that maybe we, when we return him back, to Egypt, he will hide or change his views. I was like, but what kind of argument is that? Uh, so this is an argument that they use sometimes. Um, the thing is, there's a, like two two aspects how migration board uh, evaluates uh, like the asylum when it comes to ex-Muslims. One aspect is that they are uh, this like their beliefs are genuine. And another aspect is that they would be perceived as such. They would be perceived as an atheist by other people and hence this would put them in danger. And so if this other aspect is lacking, uh, they don't see that there is a threat. So no need for asylum in that case. Um, yeah. So... But being silent... Uh, the, there is not like you can say this about anything. Then you can say this all like about being like don't any religion. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Them, yeah, and then nothing will happen. Yeah, nothing will happen to you. Uh, I would never say that no, in that situation. No, yeah. no. Um, yeah. Hmm. Um, I guess I wanted to uh, talk to you about um, why. Why did you become an ex-Muslim? Because that would be interesting to know. Because yeah. everybody has different stories, don't they? Yeah, yeah. I would say in my case, actually, it was my father who inadvertently made me an atheist. I know, right? <laughs> I think the, like, there were many factors at play. Like, like my parents sent me to like private schools where everything was taught in English. So I started learning English when I was four. And you kind of get into like almost some kind of subculture. So I was like reading mostly things that were produced outside of my own culture, like the movies, you get it. We have this saying in Egypt, like in many Muslim majority countries, they say the Western culture will corrupt the youth. There is some truth to that, <laughs> but it's not exactly corruption from my point of view. Uh, but it's like kind of broadens your horizons a little bit and like makes you think that there are other ways out there and makes you think like, okay, but why, why should I hate like gay people or why do I think that uh, men are superior to women and uh, and so on? And maybe like other values that have to do like with human rights and equality and so on, they seem better. <laughs> uh, and then there was this conflict for a while. And another thing that my father encouraged me to, to read a lot. So I was reading a lot since I was, yeah, yeah, my, I was a weird child, like spending a lot of time reading. Uh, and I think this kind of like developed some kind of like critical thinking, um, not taking just whatever people tell me for, for granted without thinking about it. Um, and at some point, because most Muslims, they take religion out of inheritance, not out of conviction. Uh, and then if you, when I started to think, okay, I was like, okay, I want to to study the scripture and be really convinced of it myself, like uh, reach my own conviction. And the funny thing is that I actually approached it from an angle that I wanted to confirm my faith in a way. Uh, and the more I studied the scripture, the more I was like, okay, it's not very nice. This is, doesn't make much sense. This is so at some point I, uh, I decided because there was like so many like contradictions in the hadith and the contradictions between the hadith and the Quran and so on. So I decided at some point to totally reject the hadith and I became a Quranist. Uh, so relying only on the Quran 
uh, for a while. Then I started to study the Quran a bit more and the history of Islam and uh, like, I was like, okay, <laughs> <laughs> this is uh, unsalv. No, I cannot salvage this. I cannot do anything. So and uh, so I would say I rejected it on on two fronts, both like rationally and ethically. So there is there was like too many things that uh, didn't like didn't sit well with me ethically like when it comes to like women's rights when it comes to gay rights and so on it was just like it's very difficult to reconcile the scripture with that uh, so this was one thing the other thing i found the idea of this like all powerful god who could have created human beings in whatever form he wants and he's like omniscient all seeing and he knows the the future and but he still creates human beings weak in order to sin and then even though he knew that beforehand he still gets angry when they sin and even though it's the way he created them and even though he's all loving and this like omnibenevolent God he sends them to burn hell in, for eternity because of the way he created them even though he knew all this would happen this just didn't like didn't compute for me so at some point I was like okay what about um, your your family and friends and that you had when you were yeah. Muslim? How how is that? Yeah, there has been friction uh, at some point, but they actually they knew about my views only after I had left. Uh, so that there would have been more friction then. But um, yeah, like I remember when when the. So when same-sex marriage was legalized in the U.S., for some reason it got really big in the in Egypt, and the people were pretty angry about it. And I had like my cousins on Facebook and uh, yeah, relatives and so on posting things like, uh, "How can they allow that? And what's next? They will allow legalized pedophilia and like things like that." I was like, "Okay." And then there was this. Um, maybe you remember that one. There was uh, like a picture that the Atheist Republic made with the Kaaba with the rainbow painted on it. So I posted that on Facebook, and well, it's like things went berserk, shit hit the roof. Like, uh, my relatives were cursing me on Facebook and blocking me, and uh, my mother, like, basically, even though she's not on Facebook, but somebody went and told her, and like, she had like almost a nervous breakdown, and like, yeah. So the, it was a, it was a lot of mess, and this happened to be coincidentally. The same day that I got my first rejection from migration board. Well, it was not a great day, that one. <laughs> yeah. so. I guess as a final question, I would say, do you have any regrets about uh, leaving Islam? And well, the, the, you had to leave your country, you had problems with your family? And no, I would not say so. Because right now, I, I would say that I live with full integrity. Uh, and I live according to the convictions that I really have, and I'm, and I'm free. And this is even though, like you know, we are not, we're never really totally safe, so to speak. But for me, I care much more about my freedom than my safety. So, no, no, no regrets at all. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm Fadi Bospuya. We're hosting a program called Bread and Roses. It's a weekly program that's broadcast in Persian and English 
in the Middle East and North Africa, primarily Iran as well, and it's also shown on YouTube internationally. And we've been doing this since last May, we're coming up to a year's anniversary, and yeah. we, we've had quite a lot of fun making these videos. We discuss taboo-breaking, free-thinking ideas. The Islamic regime of Iran has called us immoral and corrupt. And that's why the, you need to support us. We are and the alternative voice in Middle East and North Africa. Of corruption and immorality. So do support us. Here's a short video from Patreon that explains how you can help us with even just one dollar a week. That's nothing. Support us. Patreon lets fans become patrons of their favorite artists and content creators. It's different than Kickstarter because it's not about one big project that requires lots of funding. It's more for bloggers or YouTubers or web comics, anyone who creates on a regular basis. Here's how it works. When you become a patron, you're agreeing to give an artist a tip of an amount you set every time they release a piece of content, whether it's a new song, a video, or a recipe. You can set a monthly maximum to make sure that you're always within your budget. Choose an amount, enter your payment information, and you're done. Becoming a patron allows you to view and post in the artist's stream. And in exchange for your support, artists offer additional patron packages, which might include monthly Google Hangouts, music production tutorials, pre-sale concert tickets, or anything they can offer as a way to say thanks. Patreon, empowering a new generation of content creators.